This is a sermon recorded on Sunday, February 17th, 2013 at the Harbor Church in North Seattle. Dr. John Westfall speaks on Don't Be an A-Hole in the series, The Five Choices That Shape Our Lives. The scripture for today is Proverbs chapter 3. We've been in this series of messages on uh, five choices that shape our lives, right? They said there'd be no math on the test, so I've really lost track of how many we've done. And it may just keep going. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm getting invigorated. But last night, I was sitting at, the, at my desk at home, and I was so frustrated because I couldn't remember what I was supposed to be preaching on this week. <laughs> you know, it's that one of those... That was last night. That was last night. ADD moment, you know. And uh, I was getting desperate. And so I, I went what any faithful Christian pastor would do, I went on Facebook, and, uh, and I wrote, my brain is gridlocked at the moment, any ideas for a great sermon? No, really, any ideas? I'm not kidding now, help a guy out. I got three pages of help. <laughs> this is unbelievable, and uh, I'm just gonna share a few of you. The first one, right off, like seconds after I did it was, was Lynette. Uh, how to play nice with each other, biblically speaking. And then some pastor in the country said, I'm preaching my second in a series on the seven deadly sins, pride. It preaches itself. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, uh, where to look, looking inward, looking outward. Um, this Baron, I've learned enough. Time to be satisfied with all I've learned. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Baron. Um, Here's somebody, uh, hi John, uh, my favorite approach is to take a typical paradigm and uh, re-explain it, uh, Christian life from a cross-cultural or global perspective. In other words, what may be assumed within culture to be fully understood and agreed upon may be viewed entirely differently from a gospel perspective. You, you got that. Yeah. So, I don't know where he was. That's a master's thesis. And then, and I'm not saying that this one was from Baron, but it's uh, taking the eternal view of our ephemeral actions. <laughs> um, um, last minute panic? Seriously. How about the seven last things of Jesus on the cross? Uh, here's one from Illinois. Uh, read coloring. Out, I read coloring outside the lines. There are some great sermons in it. Oh no, read coloring outside the lines. <laughs> there are some great sermons in it. Uh, or you could always do the Ben and Jerry's trip and the yolk you brought back. <laughs> okay, well, that's popular in Illinois. Um, faith when God's silent, engaging our culture, revolting against it, going with the flow. Um, uh, oh, Jana Co, who's preaching at first. Bellevue CRC today oh. said, I can send you my sermon on Esther. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jenna. Uh, and then, uh, and, oh, oh, here's one from uh, someone I'm not going to mention, Mark Weber. Go to <laughs> sermoncentral.com. <laughs> That's right next to preachit.com. Uh, here's a wife of a pastor in California saying, I tell Rick this all the time, show a movie. <laughs> um, yeah. Read a provocative passage of scripture and ask the congregation what they think it means. <laughs> yeah, that's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, here's one. I'm not saying it's Phil Caldwell. How the out of balance golf swing is so much like the out of balance life. If you need video, I think I might have one. <laughs> um, and then someone. In California wrote, don't know how you do without so much help from friends. Uh, anyway, as people keep going, somebody says, I recommend using Godfather 2. <laughs> um, okay. um, Princess Bride is redemptive, someone else wrote. Um, do a series of sermons from Luke's Gospel. There's illustrations there. Someone else wrote, authenticity and abandonment. Hmm. Uh, loving the unlovable. World and religious viewpoints of today's teenagers and how uh, we can make the church and follow in Christ more relevant. Uh, buy one off the internet. Now there's, there's, there's one from Randy Rowland. Just vamp on Bruce Larson ideas like I always do, dummy. <laughs> uh, here's one. So in the end, at the end of the day, love to hear the result. Oh, here's one from Africa, from Kenya, Africa. How about how to get past what you can get over? <laughs> 
Anyway, you get the idea, right? <laughs> so, actually, the very first one from the net triggered what I had forgotten I was going to preach on this week. Uh, when she said, how to, how to play well together. I want us to, to look at the key to having a great life. There, there's one key that makes all of our life great. This is going to be a short sermon, I think. You know, I mean, it's, just, it's right there. Uh, the choice that you make of, in this area affects how long you live. It affects your physical health. It affects your spiritual vitality. It affects your relationships. And it affects your finances. Wow. <laughs> How could I have forgotten that? Spiritual, physical, relational, and financial. All of it comes together in this one choice that we make. So, uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Proverbs, chapter 3. And uh, I'm going to read a little bit here. My children, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. For they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on a tablet of your heart. Then you'll win favor and a good name in the sight of God and people. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, and your barns will be filled and overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Wow. So Lord, teach us, teach us uh, how we can have a life that's great. Spiritually, physically, relationally, financially. What would you have us do? What would you have us choose? That's our need today. In Jesus' name. Okay. Well, I saw this and went, oh, wow, I've got to crack the case here. I've got to figure this out. This is going to be so good when I, when I figure this out. And uh, I started to uh, look at it. And it all comes down to one thing, and it's verse 3. And it says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Time around the neck. Keep them with you. And so I, uh, I looked a little deeper in it, and I realized that in this uh, translation, it's not exactly the, the right word. Uh, the word chesed in Hebrew for love, that's translated love here, actually means something a little bit different. And we've talked about it. chesed. You can say that, right? Chesed. Yeah, good. Wipe the shoulder of the person in front. <laughs> and so um, what happens is this word actually translates into kindness. Kindness, um, loving kindness, and I and I. Well, what's the difference between kindness and love? Right? Aren't they the same thing? Actually, not. You know why? Because love, you can think about, you can believe in it, you can be in favor of it. You can analyze it. In fact, there's books like The Four Aspects of Love, published years ago. And, uh, and you can look at it from many dimensions. Kindness is nothing that you think about. It has nothing to do with your thoughts, with your ideas. It has nothing to do with whether you can't study more and, and get better at it through study. You can't uh, analyze the aspects of it and, and thereby experience it in your life nothing in fact it only occurs when we do it isn't that weird you know i totally believe that we ought to be more kind don't you believe that yeah that's great let's go out there with our beliefs that's not kindness kindness is only shown in what we do small acts, 
grade hacks, it doesn't matter, but it's not theoretical. It's tangible. It's probably, maybe it's the tangible expression of the love that we believe in. Right? When that actually gets expressed in some specific way, that's, that's kindness. Now, I gotta tell you, I, I've told you before, you know, when I preach, I'm preaching to myself, and I really didn't want to today. Because I'm not a naturally kind person. You all know that. You know, I can be pretty abrupt, and uh, I like to think of it as straightforward and honest. But um, uh, I can be blunt, and I can miss the clues all around me and not be kind, and, uh, and it does bug me. So this sermon, I'm just preaching to myself, and you watching the video, just feel sorry for me because I'm just preaching to me right now. So um, kindness is something, as I thought about it, it's open to everyone. It is not only for a select group of people, right? And uh, it's not something that we're born into uh, or learn through study. We talked about that. Nor is it something that we can buy. And kindness is not something you can hire someone else to do for you, which we like to do, you know. <laughs> we do go be kind. We, I, we had some friends who had a, a big company in San Francisco, and, and they sold it to an international uh, corporation for, I don't know, $100 million or something. And... Uh, we're doing pretty good. And then the company came back and said, ah, trade laws, we have to have uh, an American as one of our owners, so let's give you another share of the company. It's a gift, and then you'll be part of our ownership. And then a few years later, they bought him out, and they bought the company again from him. I mean, they're doing good. So one of the things they did was set up a company to help really rich people appear kind. <laughs> And so they would have all these highly trained, skilled, wonderfully eloquent, good-looking uh, people who will, will be assistants, and they'll, they'll send thank you notes, and they'll uh, do kind things, and they'll buy gifts, and they'll send them off in your name, and they'll take care of things, they'll write personal notes for you, they'll do all these things for you so that everyone around you knows that you're kind, and you don't do it! That's so great! We just pay somebody to do it! Is that kindness? <laughs> Wish it was, but it's not. It doesn't require any special training, I'm happy to know, and it doesn't require any special opportunities. Okay, so what do we do with this? <clears throat> you know, we've, in the news we've heard a lot about global warming and how the Earth's getting hotter and hotter. I'm looking at this and thinking that we actually may be experiencing a global chilling. I think that our relationships are getting colder. And, and we're not getting warmer as people. We're actually, I don't know if it's technology or the way we live or the, the way we've chosen to be, but we're more impersonal. And we're um, more protected and more walled off. And, and I think there's a global chilling taking place. Now, I haven't seen any news on that lately, so, um, just because it's not on the news doesn't mean it's not happening. But I think down at the bottom is that we really love our things and we use people instead of the other way around. Using our stuff and, and loving people. And uh, there's a lot of power in kindness. And um, Eileen uh, got this book for me, I think it was a hint. Um, <laughs> the Power of Kindness by Piero Ferrucci. And I just want to share what he, what he says here. It's kind of interesting. Um, Heaven save us from the fakes. Just talk about fake kindness, you know. Self-interested politeness. Calculated generosity. Superficial etiquette. And also from kindness against our will. What's more embarrassing than someone doing us a favor out of a sense of guilt? Psychoanalysis speaks of yet another type of kindness, one that hides anger. It's called a reaction formation, and you psychologists know that. And the idea is that we're so full of rage, we are so dominated by anger, and it upsets us so much so we, we unconsciously repress it. We repress the anger and the rage that we're feeling, 
and we act in a kind way. See, it's dead. But it's all this anger underneath. And so our kindness actually becomes manipulative. Uh, he, he writes, this is a false and contrived, it has nothing to do with what in our heart we really care about. Finally, weakness masquerades sometimes as kindness. You say yes when you mean no. You go along because you want to be nice. You acquiesce because you're afraid. A person who is too good and submissive ends up a loser. But think about it. All the things that kindness isn't. It's not manipulative. It's not uh, contrived. It's not based on some other thing going on inside us that we don't know about. There's a, there's a purity to kindness, right? uh, a simplicity really, uh, it's not complicated, it's not impossible. Yeah. Andy Rooney, who passed away a little while ago, he had a great insight, he said that the average dog is a nicer person than the average person. <laughs> <laughs> Now, so I've been thinking, so where does kindness begin? Especially because this, you know, i got to admit, it's a little foreign to me, you know. I had an associate pastor once who came to me and said, uh, John, could you teach me how to uh, act in such a way that people think that I care for them and that I'm being kind to them? I said, well, do you care for them? No. But, but you could teach me how to act so that they think I do, because... I should at least look like I care. <laughs> How do you answer that? This is an ordained pastor working with our youth, actually. <laughs> Teaching them how to lie and pretend when there's no basis to it. And I'm not going to, you know, Sheila knows who we're talking about. I'm not going to go into that. But, but I was so stunned by it. And then he said, why are you asking me this? And he goes, well, you know, I look at you and, you know, people think that you care for them. I thought maybe you had a secret. <laughs> I said, well, how about try caring for him? <laughs> Get out of my office. <laughs> but anyway, it's like, okay. Where does it begin? I think, it's Westphalian here, I think it begins when we realize, we finally, at some point in our life, we come to grips with the fact that we are no different than anybody else. When we hit that point, we're not special, we're not entitled, we're not better than, we're not even worse than, we're just the same, right? When that breaks through to us, we become free to not put on airs, to be ourselves, and actually to look at people that are just like us, and we become choosing to be kind to them, right? And we become kind to ourselves and to the people around us. And I, and I think our problem is, somehow, and maybe it's, I don't think it's just our country, because, you know, there's a lot of countries in the world that aren't kind. But, um, let me just go to France, you know. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, we'll strike that from the video, from the French version. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, the thing is that in our country, I, I grew up thinking I was special. You know, and, we had, and at church, people would pray, Lord, thank you that we're born in America and not like those people that are from Canada, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, we're not like them. And uh, what makes us different from Canadians? You know, I mean, they got they have Gordon Lightfoot. You know. <laughs> so um, we're the same. We are totally the same. So I was looking at a scripture. And, uh, well, okay, let's see, okay, now I'm torn. Um, okay, you have to forgive me, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what happened. And don't ever use this word in your own life, okay? Cover your ears. So we're over at Barnes & Noble about a week ago, I mean, my, and she said, John, come over here. I got the book for you. It's a, I think it's a psychology book. It's just for you. You know what it's called? Okay, forgive me. Assholes, a theory. <laughs> it's a psychology. Book. Now, why would she think this is for you? 
I wanted to believe that she thought it would help me in my dealing with you, but I don't think so now. So, so looking through this textbook, they say that asshole is someone who believes deep in their heart that they're entitled, that they deserve more. That is the heart and the root of it. That is the exact opposite of kindness. That will not give you a long life, a healthy spirituality, great relationships, and prosperity. That won't happen. Trust me, because I, I visited that area. Um, Isaiah chapter 6. It's another passage you know well, well, well. This is that one that's uh, very, very profound. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Right? I'll tell you what, if I saw that in the year that you know somebody else died, uh, and I was writing about I'd feel pretty special, wouldn't I? Wouldn't you? You saw the Lord high and lifted up and adored, and the train of his robe filled it. You were there. Cool. Right? You're surely better than us. So what happens? The sound of the angel's voices shook the thresholds and the temple was filled with smoke. Here's the response. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. You see the, the holy God lifted up and you're ruined. Why? For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And now my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. All of a sudden, Isaiah in writing this is saying, When I saw the Lord face to face in all of his holiness and majesty, I saw myself for who I am, and I'm just like everybody else. Woe to me. I'm no better. Isaiah can't go out now and talk to the people around and say, well, I saw the Lord, and let me tell you, you know, you people are in trouble. He can't do that now because he's one of them. And so then this goes on. Uh, one of the angels flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he'd taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched it to my mouth and said, this touches your lips, your guilt is taken away, your sin is atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord say, whom will, we, whom will I send? Who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. What a powerful uh, expression of true humility overwhelming us in the face of what could have been a pretty cool sense of entitlement. Knocked right out. And the freedom now to go and serve the Lord freely, Having experienced forgiveness, having recognized who we are, we're no better than anybody else, we're just like them. Now, you can go out in ministry in kindness, not in strength and creativity and all those things, just all you have to offer is kindness. Now, I think when we recognize that the issues that we've dealt with in our life and we are dealing with or we will deal with, there's a lot of, you know, issues in this room. I can take my word for it. Just on the platform, there's a lot of issues, you know. But uh, there's something that, that makes us the same in that, isn't it? Even if our issues are different, the, the reality that God's dealing with us in our stuff. So I went to some of the great philosophers, and I found this quote from one of the Jewish philosophers, uh, Goldie Hahn. Um, <laughs> stay with me. We're all the same. Goldie Hahn says, the lotus is the most beautiful flower whose petals open one by one, but it will only grow in the mud. In order to grow and gain wisdom, first you must have the mud, the obstacles of life and its suffering. The mud speaks of the common ground that humans share, no matter what our stations in life, whether we have it all or we have nothing. We're all faced with the same obstacles, sadness, loss, illness, dying, death. If we strive as human beings to gain more wisdom, more kindness, and more compassion, we must have the intention 
to grow as a lotus and open each petal one at a time in the mud. I'm telling you, she's a philosopher, right? If we're going to grow, we better recognize where we are and who we're with. And then we're free to express this chesed, this kindness. I don't know. I never really thought of kindness as a choice. I thought of it more as an attitude. But I think I was wrong. I think it actually is a choice. Uh, every step along the way, every conversation, every encounter, every situation we find ourselves in, we choose whether we'll act in loving kindness or whether we'll act in global cooling. Which is it going to be? Right? Do we make life colder or do we act in kindness? And it's so simple, it's amazing that the, the Bible says that this has the ability to give us long lives, help us physically in our, in, our, in our bodies, to help us spiritually in our relationship with God, to help us in our relationships here. All of these things, oh, and financial prosperity too, all of this comes when we choose kindness. Now, so, because I'm negative, Okay, so if we do kindness, is that going to result in everybody really being good to us? Is that why life gets so good? Well, so, Mother Teresa, people are often unreasonable and self-centered. <laughs> yeah, forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you're honest, people may cheat you. Be honest anyway. If you find happiness, people may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have and it may never be enough. Give your best anyway. For you see, here's the point, in the end, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them. That frees us to be kind, to choose it. Say, this is between me and God, really. I'm going to choose kindness in this place. The alternative is you're going to end up in a psychology book in Barnes & Noble and your wife will point it out to you. <laughs> so, take my warning. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, your call to loving kindness. And... Uh, and for your forgiveness and restoration that you bring to our lives. Give us fresh starts today. And give us the courage to choose. Amen.